Hello and welcome. I am Zotishman. I am the host of India and Global Left, moderating this conversation between Norman and Sabrina as part of Plebitis Free Speech and Left Conference. We are welcoming today Norman Finkelstein, longtime author and scholar. His academic career has spanned many decades since his PhD from Princeton University in 1987. He's written numerous books, among them the Holocaust industry, which generated significant controversy. Norman has written and spoken extensively on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Norman is a lifelong scholar and activist of the left. His latest book is I Will Burn That Bridge When I Get, it, get to It a critique of current day identity politics. Sabrina Salvati is the host of Sabi Sav's podcast and the co-host of Revolutionary Blackout Network. She is also an activist and former educator. Sabrina does leftist commentary and interviews. Recently on her podcast, Sabrina reacted to comments Norman made, minimizing in her view, the relative differences in the lives and experiences of blacks and whites in the United States today. In that podcast, Sabrina expressed strong disagreement and mentioned an interest in talking directly with Norman about these issues. Today, we bring them together as part of Plebitis Conference. Completely different because your generation has been homogenized by the capitalist system such that someone like yourself, someone like a roommate of yours, you're just a tiny notch among black, above black people. Pause. Oh my God. Why, why don't we start with Sabrina taking us from there? <laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah, so basically I, I think my concern is I, I saw the interview that you did with Aaron Mate. Um, highly respect, I have a lot of respect for both of you. Um, but I do feel like there were a couple of things that were said on on your end where Aaron, because he doesn't have that lived experience, he was not going to be able to push back on. Uh, and that was one of the comments where white people for my generation are just a smidge above black people. Uh, economically, that's actually not true. And so that's that's where I had the concern because I felt like it would have been helpful to have someone else a part of that conversation that does have that lived experience. No. Um, well, let me begin by saying that uh, lived experience works in several ways. There's the lived experience of being African-American versus being white. And there's another lived experience where you're the, definitely the beneficiary. And that is the lived experience of how many years you have been on this planet and how many years you have ahead of you. You're a young person. I'm clearly not. So when I'm speaking on these topics, I'm speaking from a fairly long uh, horizon. Uh, what I was thinking about was when I grew up, uh, the slogan was, I think it was, uh, you know, his name just slipped my mind. It was it came into my mind. It went out of my mind. It was the owner of Time magazine. And what he famously said was, in the United States, everybody's either in the middle class or on their way to the middle class. And that was a real, that was a reality for white people. It was a reality for white people. There was a realistic expectation lived out by my generation that you would own your own home. You would probably live in a suburb. You'd probably have two cars, if not more than two cars and you would enjoy a fairly prosperous future. The fact of the matter is that expectation, as I said, was correct. It was true for white people. There was a robust, there was a robust middle class. Now, for the new generations to which I was speaking, as I said, in the, con in the context was, my attendance at the George Floyd demonstrations, my experience as a professor, my experiences having uh, developed relationships with my students, which have endured over time. The new generation of white people 
have no expectations of joining a middle class. There is no middle class anymore in the United States. The, the middle class has been hollowed out. If you take my own city of New York, you could say that there are two or maybe three professions which will catapult you into what we might call the 20%. I wouldn't say it's 1% as you know the uh, 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 Occupy movement called it, a brilliant slogan, but it wasn't entirely accurate. It's not 1%, it's roughly 20%. If you're in finance, if you're in IT, and a friend of mine who's knowledgeable said, if you're in the health industry, if you're in one of those three categories, you'll be in the 20%. But outside those three categories, you're going to be in this 80%. And this 80% is not entirely for sure, but it's quite homogeneous as compared to preceding generations. The middle class has disappeared. And so my experience from talking to young people, from working with young people is, it's very noticeable that the, the prospects of young white people, you know, as Brianna Joy Gray put it, I thought very uh, excellently in an uh, uh, um, uh, interview I had with her, she said, quote, Bernie Sanders captured every, every demographic under 30. Now, that's a very revealing fact. Every demographic, black, white, Latino, men, women, every demographic, however you cut it, Bernie captured that demographic. And the answer, the answer why, why he captured, captured it is pretty straightforward. He was presenting a class platform, which virtually every demographic under 30 identified with. And that was my point. Relatively speaking, but Sabrina, you don't know my generation. That's the point. Like you could say, you don't know what it's like to be black and hey, of course I recognize no. that. Yeah. But you don't recognize what I've seen. The young people, they have no future anymore. It's really well, quite stark for somebody like me to observe that fact that they are in the same hole as basically black people right now. No full-time jobs still living with their parents, unable to start up a family, no pensions, no vacation days, no nothing, just this crap called gigs. Okay. But same right. Uh, I, I get where you're coming from. I totally understand that. I live in Boston. There's a lot of academic elite people here. I totally get where you're coming from. But the point that I want to drive home is that even when you look at the class issue, Black people are still at the bottom. We are not equal in the respect to Black people. And I'll give a couple examples. If you look at the homeless rate in this country, we, by we, I mean African Americans, we're only 13% of the general population, but we make up 40% of the homeless population. If you look at generational wealth, this is where I differ from my counterparts in academia. My white friends, come from generational wealth. So they may not have that wealth, but they come from parents and grandparents that were able to pass down homes, that were able to establish some type of generational wealth. For African-Americans, even someone like me that has a master's degree, my family had no generational wealth. I didn't come from that. So I have to build it. And I think that is the difference. And this goes all the way back to, we can talk about the general, uh, general Sherman's promise. This goes all the way back to the promise of giving free slaves uh, 40 acres and a mule, which never happened. So there wasn't land and land gives you wealth. So there wasn't that to pass down through the generations. Then you go into reconstruction. And this is a portion when black descendants of enslaved managed to achieve some degree of uh, prosperity, but all of those communities were burned down by white people. So those were the black wall streets. Then we fast forward to 08, which I did, I am familiar with, I was a part of this, the 08 housing crisis. And you have under a black president, black wealth decrease and tanked in this country because Barack Obama chose to bail out the banks instead of bailing out the American people. So the 08 housing crisis, you have black people lost their homes and that primarily targeted black people. So my point to say is not that 
we don't have that class issue. I talk about class a lot on my show, but even when you look at the class issue, black people disproportionately are affected more so than white people. And that's the point that I was trying to drive home. I would be very blind not to see those facts. And I'm, I try to try not to be um, blinded by reality. My credo in life has always been never quarrel with facts. And what you're saying is obviously factually true. And that's why in the book, in the book I wrote, uh, I was very clear that a radical redistribution of wealth from say, just hypothetically, from the top 50% to the bottom 50%, if it were just an equal distribution of wealth, I said, that's not enough because it would still leave black people at the bottom of the heap. Maybe it would bring them up a couple of rungs, you know, raise the platform, but there would still be black people at the bottom of the bottom 50% if there's a radical redistribution of wealth, the black people would still be at the bottom, bottom of the bottom, as it were, the bottom of the bottom. And I said, no, that's not satisfactory because one has to take into account all the sorts of historical uh, considerations that you just mentioned. And so I said, there has to be a radical redistribution of wealth, of course. However, that radical redistribution of wealth has to be to some extent unequal so that those at the bottom of the heap don't stay at the bottom of the heap in the event of this redistribution of wealth. And I said that that was part of the idea of the Bernie candidacy. It wasn't always clearly articulated, but he always said in his platform and you know, publicly that each of his programs would benefit the whole 80%, I'm using the figure 80%, would benefit the whole 80%, but then he always said, it would target especially those who are at the bottom. So if you have an infrastructure problem, uh, infra infrastructure program, that infrastructure program would target those communities most in need of rehabilitating infrastructure. If you have marijuana uh, distribution legal now, he said those who went to jail for using marijuana would be targeted to get those kinds of opportunities because they suffered in the past. So at every level, he was offering a radical ch uh, economic change for those, who, the have-nots, the 80%, however, also targeting those who are at the bottom for reasons which you just explicated. And I thought that was the correct approach. I agree with you that if you just have a wholesale redistribution of wealth and it's quote unquote equal, then it's just going to reproduce the same structure where Black people are at the bottom because it will just, it, now that it's trivial, it will raise their platform but not juggle the stratification, which I think for historical reasons is not fair. Right, I think that when I talk about closing the racial wealth gap, the data shows that the fastest way to do that is to implement reparations. And this is one policy where I disagreed with Bernie Sanders on this. Bernie Sanders did not agree uh, for reparations for African-Americans, but Bernie Sanders has signed on to legislation to give reparations to Jewish people in this country. And I have no no disagreement with that. But my thing is, is if you're going to, if you agree with it for one group, why would you disagree with it for another group? And I think the answer to that question is that Bernie Sanders was afraid that if he had reparations on his platform, that he would alienate the white working class. So once again, it was like, Black people, we were put on the back burner. So again, I agree with all the universal programs that Bernie Sanders had, but that still was not going to close the racial wealth gap. And I think the concern that I had is that you are articulating this statement to Aaron, who does not, Aaron is not African-American. Aaron does not have that experience. And I think that was my concern because how can Aaron push back if he doesn't 
if he does not know. That was my concern. Okay. Let me, let me just uh, comment on one aspect. Now, can, can, I, can I just add one point in that on the case of reparation? This is, I mean, one issue I also had with your book on reparation. So you have a solid point uh, on how reparation was used at that particular moment against the Bernie Sanders campaign. But that aside, I mean, as we discussed before as well, there is a very solid basis for reparation in specific cases. And, um, you know, I, I told you before as well about Thomas Piketty mentioning about reparation in the case of Haiti. And likewise, there can be very specific issues, as Sabrina is saying, about uh, the reparations to redistribute wealth in, in the case of African-Americans. So um, I, I would like to, I just wanted to add that with Sabrina's point. Okay. First of all, I'm glad we're, hon we're honing in, uh, no, honing in. We're honing in on the practical question. We won't engage in generalities, but focus on specifics, and that's always useful. So let's look at the reparations issue. Number one, this is a factual matter. Sabrina, if Bernie Sanders signed on to legislation for reparations, it was a simple reason for Jews. There's a simple reason why. It didn't affect the United States. The US didn't pay any reparations, zero. Should it have? Of course not. You know, Nazi Holocaust occurred in Europe and then occurred in the United States. The US was under no obligation to pay uh, reparations, except in one case, which I'm not gonna go into now because it's gonna get too technical. But Bernie Sanders was not signing on to legislation for the US to pay out anything. It was for Germany to pay out and for France to pay out and for Switzerland to pay out. It had nothing to do with the United States. So there was no, as it were, political price to be paid for supporting reparations any more than there's a political price to be paid if Clinton suddenly, as he did, suddenly cared about Jewish Holocaust survivors having been cheated by Swiss banks, even though that was just a crock. It never happened, uh, but that's, we'll leave that aside. Now, number two, you are absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct. You said that Bernie Sanders, he uh, opposed reparations because he was afraid of jeopardizing his uh, coalition that he was trying to build. Now, that's absolutely correct in my opinion. And then you have to deal with the question of a political reality and the coalition that you're trying to build. Now, the other people, say Elizabeth Warren, she support or Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, praised Elizabeth Warren in 2020 because she came out in favor of reparations. Of course she came out with reparations because she never expected to get a working class vote. She had a very targeted audience. It was basically, you know, the Martha's Vineyard academic uh, Silicon Valley type who are liberal, uh, but not so liberal as wanting to redistribute wealth. That's just getting a little bit too far. And so of course, she could come out in favor of reparations. Bernie Sanders faced a different political reality. He wanted to build a coalition that crossed racial boundaries, a white working class, black working class, a black poor, white poor. Uh, he was, his coalition actually straddled MSNBC and Fox News. Elizabeth Warren uh, on Fox station. Elizabeth Warren didn't try to straddle those two. She would never appear on Fox and they would never have her on Fox. So he had a political problem that he had to confront. And he recognized that reparations was a hot button issue because 10,000 excuse, 10, excuses would come up for opposing the reparations. I'm not gonna run through them, you know them all. Uh, what well, uh, the, the reaction to the reparations issue. And therefore he tried to cobble together this coalition without breaking the coalition, uh, without causing schisms and fraction, fractioning. And I have to say, Sabrina, now we could disagree, disagree on this, on this and it's fine. Fine. it's fine to disagree on this, but I think the whole reparations <laughs> issue was resurrected in order to break the Bernie Sanders candidacy. It was very calculated to break the Bernie Sanders candidacy. It's no accident, if I can say, Stalin was famous for saying that, okay, fine, but I'll say it also. It's no accident that 
the emergence of reparations, now be careful what I say, because I know you're going to come back and slap me. The emergence of reparations as a public issue, as a public issue, not in the Black community, but as a public issue, that happened with the Ta-Nehisi Coates article in Atlantic Magazine. I didn't say in the Black community, and you're going to say there's a long history in the Black community. I'm completely aware of it. I write about it. I knew the actors. I knew as a person, James Foreman. I knew that whole history. Randall Robinson, when he was in Trans Africa, and he wrote a book on reparations. I'm aware of all of that. But as a public issue in the United States, it started with Ta-Nehisi Coates in Atlantic Magazine, and then there were all these spin-off <laughs> books from it. And kill me, I do not believe Atlantic Magazine, Jeffrey Goldberg, care very much about the racial gap, racial wealth gap. I don't think that's its concern at all. I think it was a very convenient issue because the folks at Atlantic and that coterie know it has no chance in hell of going anywhere, anywhere in our political system. And then it became a, a useful weapon to taunt Bernie to badger Bernie in order to defeat Bernie. Now, in response to what you said, you know, I've known you for 10,000 years, I can't pronounce your name, Mr. Mujiar, okay? I say in the book, as a moral case, there cannot be any question that reparations are just. I said that as a moral case, I was very explicit about that. I discussed it as a political question. Was it realistic? Where did it come from? And how, in my opinion, were it to come to pass? And remember, Bernie said, if a reparations bill comes before my desk and I'm president, he said, I'm signing on to it. So he didn't have a moral opposition to it. He had, as you said, you're completely correct. He didn't want to break up his coalition. So okay. that's what I dealt with as a moral issue. Sabrina. Of course, there's a case to be made. Right. So the U.S. government did pay reparations to Japanese Americans, though. Correct. So Correct. that that did happen. And I think the 140,000 140, Japanese Americans. It was very convenient, very easy because it was such a finite number and it could make Clinton look good. Right. So that's just one example I want to bring up. But I also want to mention that Marianne Williamson did have reparations as her number one political point when she ran in 2020. That was her number one thing. So she wasn't afraid uh, to bring that message out there and to put it out there. And she had talked to people like Sandy Darity, uh, Yvette Carnell, and did the research with them. But this is something she started doing back in the 90s. She didn't start it just for a political campaign. Uh, but But to that point, I think the problem that we run into... And I was a, a big Bernie supporter. I don't support uh, the progressive movement anymore. And it, part of it is because that's a whole other story. But part of it is because I don't feel like they're actually fighting like they said that they would. But the problem that we run into is I had this feeling that there are some progressives that believe that if you just fix the universal programs, if you just fix all of that, then everything will be fine for everyone. And that's not the reality. Bernie Sanders, to me, seemed to have this notion that all we had to do was fix the class issue by those universal programs, and then everything will be fine, not considering the fact that as Black people, we still have to deal with the racial issues. Because the reality is, those universal uh, platforms that he had, that doesn't fix the K-12 through education system in these schools or in these neighborhoods. That doesn't fix the prison industrial complex. That doesn't fix uh, the job issue. So there's equality, but then there's also equity where you have African-Americans are often paid less than their white counterparts for the same positions, for the same, uh, with the same experience. It doesn't fix those, those issues. So I think that was the point that I was trying to make clear. It doesn't fix the redlining issue. It doesn't fix the home ownership issue. Black people are still being shut out of certain neighborhoods, even if they have the credit score and they have the money to, to buy a home. So those issues still need to be fixed. And I felt like with that Bernie platform or with this class only mindset, those issues are not being addressed. Um, I would say... I, I would say two things, well, three things, actually. 
Number one, I think Bernie was, look, I have a lot of criticism of Bernie right now. Uh, Bernie has lost my uh, heart with carrying on with Biden and Ukraine and all that stuff. Uh, he, I, uh, he, he's lost me, but I'm not going to, you know, you don't take people in black and white. You have to look at the full picture and also not you know, let your present um, uh, sympathies or antipathies uh, color what the past was. You know, the past, you know, John Lewis, he was just a breathtakingly brave, courageous person when he was in SNCC. Well, what happened to him when he went in the House of Representatives was a horror show. Uh, but that doesn't, I'm not going to gainsay his courage and his uh, just incredible integrity when he was the national president of SNCC. So it's the same thing with Bernie. I'm not pleased at all with how things turned out. I'm not pleased with all, all with the role he's playing now. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I have to recognize that that was a historic moment. And one has to bear in mind in a historic moment it's not so much that he had to make compromises, though he's always made his share of compromises. We all know that. Uh, it's not that he had to make compromises, but it was trying to cobble together this coalition. And in the coalition, I think it's fair to say that had his programs been implemented, a big if, but that's what a platform is. He's not yet president. He's presenting a platform. Had his programs been implemented, the biggest beneficiaries would have been, by a wide margin, African Americans. Abolish student debt. Now, you're right, in my opinion. You talked about her inherited wealth. And part of the inherited wealth was a lot of parents of whites were willing to pay off their kids' debt because they saw it was weighing on them, destroying them. All right, forget about inheritance. We'll pay it off now, you know, instead of leaving money to the kids. the kids. Blacks didn't have that. You know, uh, some parent, because of inherited wealth, able to pay off the debt. So paying off student debt, who's the principal beneficiary? African-Americans. Abolishing student tuition for the same reasons. Who's the main beneficiary? African-Americans. Rehabilitating... Um, or rehabilitating infrastructure, if it's targeting the worst infrastructure in particular, main beneficiary, African-Americans. Does that solve all the problems? No, but well, let's take your, your example of schools. Now the schools in poor neighborhoods are in very sorry physical shape. I see it, I pass it. So who would be the main beneficiary? Well, people, who go to schools in poor neighborhoods. So I think it is true that the, the Bernie platform would have, have had a differential effect from which those who are poorest, those who have suffered most, would have benefited the most. On the other hand, I completely agree with you. There are distinct special problems uh, under, usually classified under the rubric of racism, which affect minorities, African-Americans in particular, in ways that are not reducible to class. I think that is very transparent. You would have to be in very big denial not to see it. But I also have to return to that Brianna Joy Gray uh, observation. Bernie captured by a wide margin by the way, every demographic under 30, which says to me, even if the class platform doesn't solve all the problems and there are very real problems that remain, they, they, that class platform uh, solves enough, not, not completely, but enough that it attracted large numbers of young people. True, I know you're going to say, but they didn't come out and vote. Yes, <laughs> I'm aware of that. I'm painfully aware of that because the young people, they just have lost all hope of any kind of institutional change. And that's painful to have to see. And uh, that's another issue. However, 
I think for all its limitations, for all its limitations, that was the best hope at that particular moment. But I will agree as we go forward, we need young energy, new energy, fresh energy, and we need to tweak and rethink aspects of the Bernie campaign. What I will not accept is weaponizing identity to destroy the campaign. People like Cornell West, Brianna Joy Gray, Danny Glover, who have historically, well, Brianna's new to the scene, but the others, they've historically had a radical commitment. They all went with the Bernie campaign, even I'm sure, even though I'm sure they had their reservations, you know. Uh, the others, uh, Angela Davis, a hot ticket item at Martha's Vineyard, Ta-Nehisi Coates, another hot ticket item at Martha's Vineyard, Vineyard uh, Ms. Intersectionality, um, they all didn't go with him. Okay, okay. Uh, it was very telling. Just in the interest of fairness, like I, I'd like to give Sabrina to respond. Right. I do realize there were some people that were using identity politics just to try to destroy that campaign. I totally understand that. But I, I will say that some of these things still are valid. Like there are valid points to be made, but I get, I totally get where you're coming from in reference to that. It seemed like to me, uh, there was another point of the discussion that you had with Aaron, where you said that uh, basically like black, black people and white people of my generation, people are living together, have different rumors and stuff like that. And I think there's something to to point out there. Like, yes, I've had that experience, but I will say like, it's not as uh, homogenous as we would think. And, and I say this because having lived in the South where it was a little bit more common because there's the reality is there's more black people in South Carolina, there's more black people in North Carolina, et cetera. But moving from the South to New England, it is very segregated here, uh, particularly in, in Boston. It has improved over the years, but you add gentrification along to that, and that makes things uh, worse, too. A lot of the people that are African-American have been pushed out of the Boston area because it's too expensive because of gentrification. So that that's actually not so much the reality like and i had to wake myself up to that as well it was a shock to me when i did start to move around i started to see that's that's actually not necessarily the case uh people there especially particularly in the northeast it is still very much segregated there are still towns and communities that i cannot go to uh by myself without my white friend and so i think it seemed like you had this perception that like everybody was okay with each other now and that's that's definitely not the case there are there is still that covert racism which is still very strong here particularly in the northeast where people may not call you out of your name but they will make sure that you don't move into their building they will make sure that you do not become their roommate on craigslist so it just it seemed like it seemed like the perception that you had when you were talking to aaron it seemed like you seem to believe that racially things are a lot or racially, there's it's more uh, homogenous now. Like people are more together, and I have noticed that, especially traveling this country, that still is not the case. Especially as you get older, uh, it's more common. I think when we were in college, like when I was an undergrad, that was more common. We were all living on campus. When I was in grad school, it was more common. Again, we were all in school. But once I got out of school and went into real adulthood, it was not as common. Look, Sabrina, we really don't disagree. That's the thing, you know. Uh, first of all, uh, when you're when when someone like myself, you're looking for you're looking for hope, tendencies. They may still be very fragile, but there are tendencies there, grounds for being reasonably rationally optimistic. So of course, New York is incredibly segregated. We have, as is commonly known, in my city, we have the most segregated schools in the United States. South, North, East, West. New York City has the most segregated schools in the United States. I live right near Abraham Lincoln High School. I pass it every day on route to the beach where I walk or jog. It's all black. By the way, it's a white neighborhood, but it's all black. You know, totally segregated. I get that. 
I see that, and you'd have to be very blind not to see it, okay? However, it's also true to say, you know, in my, when I was growing up, the idea of having a black roommate after college, unthinkable. It was unthinkable. Even progressive whites, white people, white people, black people, black people, that's it. End of story. And now, the way I see young black and white people carry on together, it's a real culture, I want a cultural shift for me. Because in my day, whites who fraternized with blacks, it was kind of like radical posturing, you know, look at me, I have a black friend, uh, or it was uh, very patronizing. But nowadays, you feel a different kind of equality. I see it in my class, I teach at Hunter College. Hunter College is City University of New York, a public high school. And uh, first immigration, first, immig uh, first generation immigrant students and working class students, uh, because it, you, you have, uh, people are poor, they're attending the uh, public schools. And the interactions with, between the blacks and the whites, it's, uh, it's just much more natural. Now, do they are racist thoughts fleeting through their heads? Of course, of course. How can it not be? Are sexist thoughts racing through their heads? Of course. How can it not be? Are various kind of quote unquote phobic thoughts racing through their heads? Of course. How can it not be? But is there a lot more solidarity, warmth, humanity now than in my day? Yes, it's very different. I'll give you an example, which touches me, it touches me. Whenever a student has to get up in front of the class and give some sort of public presentation, okay? And you know, these students are not so confident. It's not like if you've gone to the Ivy League and you're used to classes of six and 10 in the class. And so you learn how to develop self-confidence and composure and all of that. These students are in classes of 30 and 40. Most of the time, they're kind of hiding in the woodwork, if you get my point. So when I put them on the spot, you have to get up on, in front of the class. It's very striking to me. It's an observation I bring to you as a person who's taught most of his adult life until he was blacklisted, but for most of his adult life. Whenever a student gives a presentation, black, white, woman, man, first generation, 10th generation, whenever they give the presentation, however much they faltered, however much they may have faltered, all the other students give them a round of applause, spontaneous round of applause. You know, it was like, there but for the grace of God go I, I could have been on the hot spot in front of the class. And so there's this warmth, there's this solidarity, uh, which I've never seen before. You know, in my day, everybody's competing against each other, you know, the elbowing, the elbowing. And here there's a kind of solidarity. Now you might say, oh, Norman, you're talking about 10 people, you're talking about 20 people, wake up, smell the coffee, look at the rest of the country. Yes, I'm talking about a tendency. Tendencies, unfortunately, because your generation has to worry about climate change. Uh, but tendencies take them time to work out. Uh, as Mr. Mujia will know, uh, I was reading something by the great Marxist economist who was a friend of mine, Paul Sweezy, and he writes in 1980, 1980, 40 years ago, he says, you know, the capitalist system is facing a crisis now. And he says, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to find a way out this time. And then he says, all of you Marxists who wrote off the working class in the United States, hopeless, too rich, too privileged, all of you people who wrote them off, he said, you know what? It may be premature to write them off because they may actually become again, given that the capitalist system is in crisis, they might again become a radical force. Now he said that in 1980, it took 40 years for those tendencies to play themselves out. And they finally bubbled to the surface with the Bernie Sanders campaign. And suddenly you saw that possibility, which Sweezy, Paul Sweezy, the economist, he could discern 40 years ago that there may be a new opportunity. So what I see are shoots, S-H-O-O-T-S, 
shoots of the possible, and I am deeply moved by them and hopeful of them because of that time uh, arc that I've benefited from. I know what it was like back then. I know what it was okay. like. The most radical of whites, it was always still, including me, don't think I'm exempting myself. It was still posing, posturing, and patronizing. You got those three Ps, posing, posturing, and patronizing the relationship between whites and blacks. And I think among working class kids, it's different now. I hear where you're coming from with that. I think I think we agree more than than I thought we would agree. <laughs> I think we agree more than I thought we would would agree. Yeah, it's and you know I've read like some of your work. I think it was just it was that particular interview that just kind of got me. Lena, I just I had to I had to pause. Uh, so some of the things that I heard and I just thought to myself like this is, I don't know. There's so many other things that I could say uh, economically. When we talk about the banking system, there's all this, we're hearing about the banks now that are closing again. So I feel like we're heading back to 08 all over again. But even when we talk about banks, I've been really pushing people to try to start public banks, whether it's in your city or your state. Uh, however, North Dakota is the only one that has a state public bank. And the reason I push this is because we have to detach ourselves from the central banking system. And if you look at predominantly black neighborhoods, most of those neighborhoods either don't have a bank or they have very few. So they have to leave the community to do their banking or they have to go to places in the community like the payday loan places or the check cashing places. And those businesses are very predatory uh, on the community. And it's just things like that that I see. I see the difference in white neighborhoods versus black neighborhoods. They don't have those businesses in the white neighborhoods. So these are just some of the th concerns that I've had. No comment from me because it's obviously correct. You walk through a black neighborhood, you see those predatory businesses. That's uh, that's just obvious. And as I said, there are black neighborhoods and there are white neighborhoods. And anybody who says otherwise is you know full of shit. Obviously, <laughs> uh, the place is very segregated. However, I would say if you go in, the, you know, I don't know uh, geography outside my own stupid borough. But if you go into places like Fort Greene, Bedford, Stuyvesant, where the young people live nowadays, most of them live in uh, oh, those kinds of areas. areas. Um, it's basically, I, I can meet any young person and I'll say, let me guess, you're living four to an apartment, each of you is paying about $1,100, and you have one gay person, one black person, one woman, and one white, you know, one cis male, whatever. And they'll say, yeah, that's exactly right. Because uh, that is what's going on now and the other part that's going on is black white whatever color you are they're struggling to make that month's rent they have a real problem making that month's rent um uh, yeah i just wanted to add something on this i mean i came to the united states very recently it's been less than six months and i came to chicago and i think my my lived experience like as non-american uh tells me that a the city is very very segregated i mean you can go along the streets and you find that majority would like on the north of where I live, like it would be white working, like white uh, middle class and you know, down. And it's not just the housing, it's the labor market. So you, you refer to the health sector. If you look at the health sector, there is a tremendous segregation of who, who are the nurses and who are the, those who during the COVID were termed as essential workers oh, and who are the doctors. And every other security guards, every other those who would, you know pick your ex, I mean, they are almost entirely um, black uh, women and men. So, and these some of these uh, things are important, and it brings us back to the class issue because one of those class moment in the United States was the New Deal moment, and the New Deal moment actually created some of that segregation in the labor market because it was the male white earner who got these sort of industrial jobs. And then after the World War, they went on and on. And the black families were pushed into this informal casual market, both men and women. And this happened despite the CIO trying to organize. So I guess the, the, the class issue should be looked at in a more, more multiracial. Uh, it's, it's not race versus class, but the class itself is a more multi multiracial. And this last point I, I wanted to add in here is that perhaps 
inequality is much more than just income and wealth. This is something someone like Amartya Sen brought to our attention back in the 90s. And I read a recent, it's not a recent study in Chicago itself, um, Streeterweil versus uh, Englewood. The life expectancy, these are two neighborhoods in Chicago, maybe a few miles apart. Life expectancy in Streeterweil, which is a white, is 90. I mean, that's the highest in the universe, as high as it is in Japan. And in, the, uh, in Englewood, it's 60, which is a black working class neighborhood. And it's as low as it is in the sub-Saharan Africa. So, and I don't think that Bernie Sanders kind of movement is enough. I mean, we should, we should express hope in that, but we should constantly, we should not restrict our politics, at, at least something I see as an outsider, to the you know, politics of Warren versus Sanders and so on. This politics of reparation, politics of wealth inequality, politics of the labor market, I guess, should go beyond what is defined by these practicalities of presidential election. Right. You you brought up the, the New Deal. That was a good thing to bring up as well, because there were issues that happened with that, too. Although the New Deal did help some people, but there were certain policies there were red. Again, the redlining with the housing issue that came about because of the New Deal. So there were black people that were kept out of those communities. So oftentimes I'll hear like progressives say that they wanted this FDR Democrat. Uh, they want like a New Deal and not realizing that the New Deal did hurt uh, African-Americans and indigenous people in this country. I'm not an expert on it. I don't pretend. My other credo in life is no investigation, no right to speak. I got that quote from Mao Zedong. Um, and I think it's a good I, it's a good concept. No investigation, no right to speak. Or in modern colloquial language would be, if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, shut the fuck up. So I don't know anything about this topic. <laughs> So, but I have read historians, good young African-American historians, basically the Torrey Reed generation, not his father at all, but the Torrey Reed generation. And they've had, they present a nuanced picture of the New Deal's, New Deal Blacks benefit from some aspects of it, that Blacks did not benefit from other aspects of it. It's a mixed picture. And that would be predictable given at the time of the New Deal, Blacks had next to no political power. Uh, we're now living literally Almost a century later, uh, things have changed a lot. And I agree with uh, Mr. Mujiar that um, uh, we have to we have to um, take to heart these real issues of race. There's just no getting around it. And I think the problem was, you know, Bernie was trying to balance a coalition. Whether he did it perfectly, I don't know. I I have to say, I respect the judgment of people like Cornell West because he goes back a long way. And people like Danny Glover, who I remember as being involved in the anti-apartheid movement, he goes back a long way also. We're talking about already 40 years ago, the anti-apartheid movement was in the 1980s. Uh, we're already in 2023. But I remember these people were very principled and, uh, and, and decent. So I have to think that on balance, we can use that expression, on balance, Bernie was doing the right thing. However, recognizing that things have to be rethought, reconsidered, and trying to get the balance right, to get it you know, finely balanced and get it right. My problem is very simple. It's very simple. The people who in the identity politics, they had no interest in getting the balance right. Their interest was to destroy Bernie. That's what they're paid for. That's why they're feted in Martha's Vineyard. That's why they're at the Oscars. That's why they're in all these very elite watering holes because they're doing their job. And their job, their job was, was, you know, exactly, exactly what, what Whoopi Goldberg said to, to Bernie, Bernie Sanders. Sanders. When are you getting out of this race? That's, that was her job to confront Bernie. When are you getting out of this race? That's what identity politics with a capital I and a capital P, that's what it was all about, getting rid of Bernie and the politics he stood for. It wasn't personalized with Bernie. It was the politics of the pocketbook and not the politics of the posturing and preening and patronizing. That's what had to be stopped. And they were rolled out 
just like in South Carolina, Jim Clyburn was rolled out to stop the Bernie campaign. It's often forgotten today, even though it's not old news. It's often forgotten today. Up until South Carolina, it looked, it looked like Bernie like was going to win. It was, it was so, so terrible that people like James Carvel were literally having heart seizures on camera, on TV. And the polls showed in the last week that Bernie was going to win South Carolina. That's right. It looked like Bernie was going to win. And Jim Clyburn refused to endorse anyone. And then the screws were turned on him. What do you mean? We made you number three in the House of Representatives, and you're not going to do what you're supposed to do? And then he endorsed Biden. And 60% of African Americans said their vote on primary day was influenced by Jim Clyburn's endorsement of Biden. And that's what killed Bernie, because it was already assumed if he won South Carolina, he was going to sweep Super Tuesday, which was four days away. It was the identity politics. It was these people who serve their function that destroyed the campaign. Now, with you, Sabrina, of course I can have a dialogue and I gotta listen. I gotta listen, A, from humility. I don't know what it's like to be African-American and B, because what you said is just obviously true. And okay. I assume, though I don't know you with any kind of you know intimacy, I have to assume, yes, we basically agree. We wanna give a fair shake to everybody in this country and the ones who deserve the fairest shake are the ones who have been shafted the most and that's African-Americans and other minorities. So I assume we're on the same page, but I don't think those identity politics people are on the same page. No way, no possibility, you'll never convince me. I do not believe, Angela Davis is very smart. Now, I don't know how much you know about Angela Davis, but she was my childhood sweetheart from afar. I know a lot about Angela Davis. She studied at the Sorbonne. She studied with Adorno, at the Free University in West Germany. At 22, 22, she was teaching Kant in the University of California, UCLA philosophy department. I'm, nearer, I'm nearly 50 years older than 22. I still can't understand three pages of Kant. And she was teaching at 22. And she also had a militant history. We have to be honest. I mean, yeah. she spent time in jail. She showed real physical raw courage, no question in my mind about it. So this very bright woman, extremely bright woman, don't tell me she's oblivious to how she's being used. No, <laughs> I do not believe that. Angela Davis knows exactly what's going on and she's going along with it. And for me, that's very sad. Well, some of the people who were considered to be rev revolutionary back then are not revolutionary anymore today. I have noticed that. Um, I had a quick question, if your time permits, like a last segment, sort of as a close closing to the um, this discussion. I don't know if your time permits. Yeah, last question is fine. fine. Okay, so um, I, I'd like to ask this with maybe begin with Sabrina, and then we can close with Norman on this. And this is uh, this sort of relates to the conference that we are holding on free speech. And my question is on the, the impact of cancel culture on free speech. And maybe my question more pointedly to Sabrina is on the media itself. So you, you I mean, I, I'm following you recently and you've been involved in the war against, um, the, the, the rally against the war and so on. So how, how do you look at the impact of cancel culture on, um, on the media in general? I think mainstream media media is very effective still, even though they're losing ratings, um, they still have a way of getting a message across, a narrative across that tells the American people that anything outside of that narrative is incorrect or 
these people are Russian apologists or Putin puppets or whatever. They've they've come up with ways to smear people, uh, people like Matt Taibbi recently with the release of the Twitter files. Uh, anyone who speaks against that mainstream uh, narrative, but I will say I think more people are waking up to uh, independent media, especially those that have been censored it's actually given them more attention. So when someone does get censored, more people reach out and look look for them because they're like, oh, I wanna know what happened with that individual. But I'll also say uh, in reference to cancel culture, there's only one person, at least in my lifetime, that I remember being really canceled and that was the Dixie Chicks. They were canceled because they spoke out against the war in Iraq to the point where they couldn't book venues for like 10 years. So they were canceled, or canceled. 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 Uh, but people like uh, Dave Chappelle who, Every other month, it seems like there's a call to cancel him on Twitter and things like that. Like Dave Chappelle's not getting canceled. Like he's still going to be able to book gigs and venues and get uh, Netflix specials, et cetera. Those people are going to be fine. But I do sincerely worry about the rest of those that are in independent media that continue to speak out against this war in Russia and Ukraine, that call for peace, uh, more of the anti-imperialist voices, the anti-war voices, those voices are being heavily smeared by now, um, even by people in, in independent media are smearing them. And those are the ones that I, I really have my eye on because I think it's only a certain amount of time before they'll start to try to remove them from different platforms. I've seen people removed from PayPal. I've seen them removed from um, Patreon. Patreon is the other one uh, because they have that message. And that's very uh, concerning that they're trying to silence people like Gray Zone, or they're trying to silence people like a Whitney Webb. Uh, we need to be very conscious of that. And we need to make sure that those voices don't go away. Uh yeah, I'll give Norman the quick uh, the the, the uh, closing. I just have very quick follow up on the media to Sabrina, um, which is on. You talk about the independent uh, media, the you know those who are outside, both Fox and CNN, and so on. And there, within the left, I mean, there is a huge proliferation of media, um, independent media on the right. I'm talking about the independent media, which can be broadly called as the left. I, as an outsider, can see a sort of divide within that. And mm -hmm. one side of it is sort of broadly within somewhat left, but is anti-Republican. And if if you want names, it would be like TYT, Majority Report, which would be like anti-Republican. And I see the other side sort of almost like a mimicking of that, which has become an anti-Democrat. And where you, and, and I see the Jimmy Dores and things like that, I mean, which, which would go on and just, you know, dig dirt on the Democrats. And then the sort of bigger left politics sort of within these two camps, I see it fizzling out. How do you look at it? Because I, one of the things I admire uh, about what you are doing is not fall into these two camps. So if you can just very quickly respond to that and then Norm would follow up and you can close. Sure, um, I despise both parties. Um, I'm a registered independent. Uh, I did. I was on board for the Bernie Sanders movement. Uh, and then after that, and after the performance of the squad that we've seen over the past couple of years, I just decided, I said, I can't deal with corporate parties in general. So I encourage people to either support candidates that are independent or that are third party candidates uh, instead to get yourself outside of that duopoly because they're just corporate owned and nothing's going to change uh, there. But I think the big divide is is not so much Democrat and Republican right now. It's anti-war versus uh, being pro-war or soft imperialism. Uh, those are things that we need to pay attention to. The people who are making claims about China that have not been proven to be true. The people who are making excuses for the billions of dollars that are going to Ukraine instead of the American people here right now. And then there's also a divide between the mandate and the anti-mandate uh, yeah. left as well, so. No. Um, there are a number of things to say, but the time is limited, so I'm gonna just make so bullet points. Uh, aside from the Dixie Chicks, you might recall, I forgot her name, it just slips my mind, uh, the woman who was on uh, The View. Uh, she's a, a, a comedian, but she got more serious. What was her name? And she got kicked off the show because of her views on the Iraq? Oh, you was must... it Rosie, o Rosie yeah, O'Donnell? Rosie O'Donnell. Oh. Yeah, Rosie O'Donnell, because she was, uh, Rosie O'Donnell got very serious about the war in Iraq. 
And she started to come up with facts and numbers. And you know, this disoriented the whole program, which is supposedly like, you know, like a little tea party in the morning. Uh, and she got very serious. And she got kicked off the program by Barbara Walters. It was very interesting. I don't know how, I don't know I don't how you are. So I don't know how memory is on these things. It was very interesting who replaced her. Do you remember, you remember who replaced her? Replaced her, replaced her, replaced her? I don't remember who replaced her. Okay, I haven't I'll watched the show in a while. Go back and look. It was Whoopi Goldberg. They wanted to find somebody who was hip but safe. Hip mm -hmm. but safe. And Whoopi with her grandma, you know, grandma uh, glasses and her dreads. She and dressed, you know, hip like a bohemian. They chose her to replace Rosie O'Donnell because Rosie O'Donnell got too serious. And that tells you, in my opinion, a lot about identity politics. It tells you a lot about identity politics. It was the same thing, if I can say, I know this is a tangent, but it's insightful, in my opinion. You could disagree. Uh, what happened with Chris Rock? Chris Rock was an excellent social commentator. If you look at his videos from like 20 years ago, they were very sharp, very acute, very clever. Then there was that problem of that Black strike in the Oscars in 2016. And Blacks went on strike in Hollywood because uh, they weren't nominated for anything that year. Who did they get? Who did they get? They got Chris Rock. And the moment Chris Rock got that Oscar position, he became totally neutered politically. I was very struck. I know this is a tangent, but I was very struck. That last Netflix um, show of his, did you watch it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was so gross. It was so vulgar. It was so juvenile. It was so unfunny. It was so unclever. And I thought to myself, that's the price you pay if you want to host the Oscars. That's why before Chris Rock, who hosted it all the time, Whoopi Goldberg. The safe people who are hip, so Holly could could show how, oh, how down it is with the hood. It has, <laughs> you know, it has Whoopi, it has Chris Rock. We're real cool. We're real chill. Like Jeff Goldberg from the Atlantic Magazine, when he's on with Ta-Nehisi Coates, he calls him T. He calls him T. So hip, so cool, so down with the hood. Um, on the question of the media, um, my own feeling is that after the Bernie's candidacy, Sanders candidacy co co uh, collapsed, evaporated, the web got filled with people who were fighting turf wars. Uh, your memory may not be as clear as mine, and I'm certainly not a web person at all, but it was very striking. It was very striking that after the Bernie San during the Bernie Sanders candidacy, you would find Jimmy Dore would be on. Brianna Joy Gray, Brianna Joy Gray would be on Crystal Ball. Everybody was friendly. Everybody was, we were in this together. There was a real harmony, sympathy, warmth, solidarity, because we were all for Bernie. It's our generation. The moment it died, well, viewer, reason, viewer interest collapsed by probably around 90%. And so now all these people have to carve out little turfs for themselves and all the elbows came out. So now they start to snarl, snarl at each other and curse each other and each accusing the other of being a traitor and a this and a that. Uh, that to me was a market problem. Interest in this particular world of the web it had precipitously dropped by about 90%, I think. And, I mean, I used to watch Crystal Ball and Sagar religiously every morning to find out what's going on with the primary, what's going on with the primary. Uh, the moment it ended, I stopped watching it. So then they started this kind of very vicious internecine conflict on the left over basically, I think, pretty insubstantial issues. Not always, but often it was kind of became very, very toxic. Very, very toxic. My view is if a new class movement emerges, that's a big if, but if it does, you'll see a lot of that toxicity will disappear 
in trying to build the movement, knowing full well that your viewership doesn't want to see the toxicity. They're not interested in it. Too much snarling, too much um, uh, nastiness, too much nastiness. So that to me is the is the root source of what happened with the all sorts of divisions that you described, anti-vax versus pro-vax, anti-war versus, it was a lot of it was the fact that it was a turf war now by people who were struggling to maintain their viewership when viewership had significantly declined. Um, mm. The other thing I would say, and that's where we'll leave it off, at least for me, is the identity politics is like a kind of froth at the top of the ocean. You look at students, you talk to people, how many students, I've taught now probably around 300 students. I was you know, out of work for 15 years. Now I occasionally get some adjuncting. In those, uh, of those 300 students, exactly two, two, have shown any concern about pronouns. Now, you know, in woke sectors, pronouns, like there's a big story on the web. Uh, Judith Butler in 2020 announced her new pronouns. Now, for most people, they don't give a flying fig about pronouns. They've got <laughs> bigger problems in their mind. So a lot of the identity politics is at a very, very superficial level. It has a very damaging effect. You know, you don't want to be hauled down to human resources uh, because you use the wrong pronoun, literally the case. Uh, so they have a really pernicious effect. But in terms of actually resonating with large numbers of people, I don't think that's true at all. Most of it, most people know it's nonsense. People don't menstruate, women menstruate, people don't get pregnant women get pregnant. This is all very, this is all, you know, Martha's Vineyard wokeness that has about zero, zero, zero minus one impact on real people in the real world. However, they exercise levers of power, which can make life very unpleasant for an awful lot of people, especially not exclusively if you're teaching in the university, obviously it's in corporations also and so on and so forth. Okay, here you go. Uh... Thanks so much for your time.